Hey everybody, John Grimsmo here, bringing you another shop vlog with some Kern action. It's already four o'clock, I've been busy, I'm hot, I'm sweaty, but I got some work to do. So right now I'm putting in a uh, PG25 holder on an HSK shank with uh, an AB Tools indexable dovetail end mill. And I'm using this one, I've also got their smaller version, um, but I want this one for uh, some of the pallets that I'm making right now. So it's kind of a big honker for this machine, but it should be fine. So I need to put this, oh look at that, into 194, which is this one. Okay, now I gotta touch it off. Okie dokie, first thing. Man, okay. Fraser, buy me a tripod, put it right here, because <laughs> I need a tripod. Um, we have he's got his own tripods, but I want I want a John tripod right here that never leaves. I think that would be very handy. Because I'm sick of using just one hand to do everything. Um, I haven't talked to Fraser about this yet, so I, I, sh I have nothing to complain about. This is all on me. 194, 194. So I go into here and type 194. I type tool call. And then the robot's going over there. It's grabbing it right now. Tool not defined. Duh. I'm telling you, man, when I'm filming, I don't think as straight as when I don't film. So what that means, tool not defined, is I have to cancel that. I have to go into the tool table. I have to scroll all the way up. 194, I have to call it something, and I have to type the relative length and the relative diameter, like the guesstimate of that, um, before the tool will call it. That's good. It's a good safety valve for the machine to have. So I'm going to do that. Okay, so I have quickly defined those tools. Let's go left hand here. Okay, so now call 194. There we go. That's happier. The robot's going, it's grabbing the tool, it's putting into the loading station. The door's gonna open up in three, two, one. The tool goes in, whoa, it's a big boy. It is bigger and longer than anything I've put on here before. Maybe not longer, but. Um... All right, now let's touch it off. So I just go tool setting, that's it. Hit cycle start. Look at that. Is that gonna fit? I mean, I know it will fit. I'm gonna eyeball, make sure that thing will fit. I don't know. I don't know. That would be an extraordinarily expensive mistake if I made that wrong. So I'm gonna walk it in very slowly and make sure I know what I'm doing here. That is not gonna fit. Um, hmm. Interesting. Maybe there's a way, because it's the tool setter is a laser beam. There's literally like a light beam, and as the tool comes down, the beam breaks, and it senses it very, 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 very accurately. But seriously, it, it ain't gonna fit. And the machine actually complained. It said. Uh, DCM tool laser BL10 something something whatever that means because um, it ain't gonna fit and that's why you define the tool beforehand so the machine can go hold up that ain't gonna work um, maybe if this is the laser beam between my two fingers maybe you can move it sideways so that it can just fit in but only if the machine lets you I, I don't know I don't know I don't have a good way of measuring the tool length accurately otherwise. I don't have a presetter. I'm actually finally opening my brain as of our podcast a couple days ago to the, uh, to the idea of buying a tool presetter like a Zoller or a, uh, I forget all the brands, but there's, there's lots. And what a tool presetter is, it's a device outside the machine that uh, measures the tool height. So if this were your tool, it's not, but you would put it in the machine and the machine has its own laser beam that comes down and says, oh, your tool is this long from, from the gauge length. Your tool is this long. It's exactly this diameter. It spins it. It tells you how much run out it has. They usually have an inspection microscope on it too, so you can see like on a screen up close all the 
if all the flutes are gone, if they're chipped, if they're blah, 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 man, we really should get one. I'm selling myself on it as I'm explaining it to you guys because I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it. Okay, I'm gonna think about that. Because I, I would use it right now. Like, right now, I would use it to touch off that tool. And that would be, nah, shoot. They're like 20 grand or more. Probably more for the expensive ones. Like the nice, more featured ones. Um, anyway. All you tool reps out there, I don't need lots of emails telling me to buy this one or that one. <laughs> but suggestions, I'm, uh, I like suggestions. It's always good. I don't know, I'll think about that. Um, okay, I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do. The, I don't need to use this tool. I could use... All I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do a dovetail on my part. Now, the past few days, we've been doing a lot of dovetails um, with this guy right there, that last one. That one. It's a little dovetail. It's a very sharp, pointy corner. Um, the pallets I'm making right now, the reason I want to use that tool is because it's got a fat 15 thou radius on the corners, which I'm making repeatable, uh, multi-use, um, what am I trying to say? Dovetails that are gonna be used hundreds of times, not just throwaway items. Um, so I wanna create the strongest joint possible and having a radius in that tiny little inner corner makes a stronger joint, it just does. Um, that's why I wanna use that bigger tool, but not if it doesn't fit. So I might have to get a little creative here. I don't know, let me think about it. In other news, uh, air conditioner progress. Let me show you real quick what the plan is. I'm actually talking with the guy. We're getting a 10 ton unit, like we got quoted on a 10 ton unit and talking to a few friends and the guy again, I'm like, maybe we should get a bigger one. Holy cow, it's washed out, there we go. But anyway, we had, uh, it's gonna go here. So we had concrete guy come in today and frame out the pad and then on Monday, he's gonna pour the concrete here and he's got another job on Monday, he's gonna pour the concrete. And uh, so he should be here about one o'clock uh, in a couple days. And pour that guy and then uh, I know that when you put when you pour put it this way when you buy a big fancy machine like a Kern or like certainly the bigger heavier machines uh, a lot of times you should be cutting out a section of the concrete and pouring a like super duper thick pad instead of putting a you know big heavy machine on four inches of concrete here we have six plus inches so we, we were fine but yeah a lot of a lot of guys will when they get their five axis machine or their big whatever, they'll pour a pad just around the machine and that has to cure for 30 days. Whereas this, we're just putting a little air conditioner on it, well, decent sized air conditioner. Um, we think it can be ready in a couple days. So I'm not too worried about that. But yeah, in the next week, the, uh, the guys are coming. Put that in. So that's good. That's very good. Check this out. We got a chip bin, like a big honking monster. started filling it up. I don't like how it's outside and uncovered, but meh, what are you gonna do? Um, I don't think I've ever showed our backyard. So this is, this is the back of the building. Look at this. Look at that. Look at how much room we have. We're renting this unit, like we're leasing the place, so this is not technically ours to like use. We have 30 feet back here, but I just, nice that it's open. We've considered actually buying this building as soon as we can, um, this whole property. And I mean, there's a lot of room for activities back here. Just saying. But yeah, so the air conditioner is gonna go right on the other side of that wall. Vents are gonna come out. Cold air coming in. That's a good thing. That's what we want. So, aha, we might have some, uh, some potential here. So this is the tool screen for uh, probing operation 584. So normally I have this value as zero and it goes length and, sorry, I'm not looking at the camera. Normally I have this as zero so it does length and radius. I can change it to just do length or just do radius. And since I have the tool in the program, um, in the tool table, set to offset to the side as default, so it's a two inch cutter, it's gonna move uh, 0.9 inch radially to measure just the outside flutes. If I choose just that, it might work. We'll see, let's, let's carefully do this. So I just learned something. I've been uh, DMing with somebody on Instagram. I posted a picture of these jaws, and uh, he sort of he opened my eyes to something very obvious, but that I had not fully articulated yet in my mind. So right now, the way I made these jaws, they're a round profile. So they have this beautiful round curvature to them that fit the round bar. And 
without thinking too deeply about it, my brain goes, yes, that's a good fit, that's awesome. But what this guy was saying, he actually showed me an awesome book from uh, an, an awesome page out of a tooling book that he has that talks about uh, fixtures and V-blocks and things of that nature. And I sort of, I realized some of these things while I was making the thing, because if you have a round object that you're holding and you have a, a round, uh, you know, soft jaw like that, that you're cupping it with, if this diameter is too big, then you're only touching there. If it's too small, then you're only touching on the ends. And how do you know, I mean, this machine can make like perfectly made of parts and I got this pretty darn close. I didn't measure it to verify, but um, the point is holding a round object with a round object is not a good clamping method because you don't know at what point it's actually contacting and how much surface area it's contacting. If you go a little bit undersized, then the jaw maybe will flex and it'll fit, and I don't know, there's math there, but uh, the point is, use a V-block. So hold the thing like this, and uh, give me a second. Now you guys have seen me on this machine use this V-block that I got back in my Tormac days to hold a round object several times because it's quick and easy and I can just throw it in the vise and let it clamp around it, no big deal. It literally has not occurred to me yet that I could make jaws, just like I did yesterday, that have this profile into it or whatever profile I decide to go with. Um, it, it's like one of those stupid mind-blowing things like, duh, yes, why, why did I wait so long to think about that? Um, and also with the V-Block, you can fit, uh, well, for example, a little tiny round thing or a bigger round thing or, you know, there's a range. Um, but yeah, otherwise with my cupped round fixtures, I gotta make uh, you know one for each exact bar diameter that I have. And I've got probably three that I'll be using them on. So there were probably a lot of comments in yesterday's video going, don't do that, do a V-block, but I haven't read them yet. So it's coming to me for the first time. Um, but yeah, kind of obvious when you think about it. And I'm kind of rethinking of how to do things in the future. But that's how I learn. I try something, it's in my head, I need to do it, I need to learn from that mistake, um, or it just works and it's fine and I never think about it, and uh, move on from there. Okie doke, so I have a plan for touching off this tool. I, I cannot find a way to do it in the laser right now. There might be a way, but I can't find it. I've been DMing with a bunch of my guys on Instagram um, who run similar machines or similar controls or whatever. One guy says he's able to do it on his Hermeline machine, but uh, I don't know. So. I'm done messing around with it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the exact tool length by touching off of a surface and either using a shim or a gauge block or something and kind of mathing my way to a very close result. I don't need this to be micron height level. I need it to be very close, very close, but not perfect. So I'm just gonna find a way to make it work. I did strongly consider, I even got halfway through changing my model uh, to use that smaller dovetail end mill that's in the tool changer right now, the small one with the sharp corners. But you know, I, I got halfway through doing it and I'm like, no, I want the one with the big radius. It's gonna make a better fixture. I will feel more confident with it. It's just what I want. It's my idea. I want it to happen. So I'm gonna make it happen. Uh, I do think it'll make a better result though. So let's quickly figure out how to make that happen. So in the Kern, I have loaded up a blank flat pallet, nothing on it. I have my PFG stones from Kinetic Precision. My buddy Spencer, listen to this. Oh, such a good sound. And then the rougher grit. I love it. This is how you clean the stones. You rub, they always come in a set of two. You rub them against each other, and it gets all the dirt and stuff either into the pores or off the material. Um, so I'm going to use these just to quick sanity check the, fl the plate, uh, make sure there's no, uh, no little burrs or boogers or anything sticking off. All right, so here's my quick and dirty uh, thing. I don't actually have any gauge blocks here in the shop. I have round pins, but I don't have any square gauge blocks. So I found a parallel, I stoned it smooth, I found a little section, I measured it. Um, I put it under a thread mill, which has a very flat bottom, so that uh, you know no flutes are getting cut on the bottom or whatever. And I jogged the machine down slowly until this just like, I can't really wiggle it up and down a teeny tiny bit, 
I can jiggle it forward and back. I got a feel for it, and I'm, I'm happy enough with it right now. And then what I did is I set the uh, Z height position to be zero. So then I think, as long as I keep that in roughly the same position, maybe I'll keep it like this so it doesn't fall. Lift that up, change in the dovetail tool, uh, jog down and, until a tooth feels about the same on one of those, like right there, and then mess with the tool offset until it reads zero and makes sense. I think this will work. Yeah, that totally worked. That was great. Worked awesome. And I'm confident it's it's well under a thou, which is enough that I need for this. Uh, from my feel, it's probably under half a thou, which is good. It's not full kern, but it's fine for what I need. So, done, move on, let's do it. I have set the tool, I verify it, I call the offset again, I make sure it's good. I know that it says zero. I'm pretty, pretty happy with this. Okay, last thing on that, because that tool has three flutes, and the flutes are almost always never perfectly identical. I went through and I measured each one individually. Uh, I, I happened to be on the lowest one, the, or the highest one the first, which is bad. So then I went around and I was like, oh, it's a little bit lower. And then I went around again, oh, it's a little bit lower. So I settled on the, the lowest flute, which is gonna be the lowest cutting surface and uh, got it nailed. Let me show you some beautiful num 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 num. So check this out. I figured I would stop it mid-program to explain to you guys something cool. So yesterday in the video I was talking about blue chips. When the chip gets so hot that the, the metal cutting chip itself, the part that gets removed from the material, gets hot and the heat goes away in the chip. That way the cutter stays cool, the workpiece stays cool. Uh, let me feel this. Oh yeah, it's cold. Cold. Um, that last cut made blue chips. With or without coolant, doesn't really matter. Let me show you. Yeah, that worked pretty good. If you're uh, if you're wondering about the bubbling, I'm pretty sure there's just a gentle, constant pressure of air coming out of there to keep the feet clean, the pads clean, and to measure for uh, seating. I think of the of the feet on the Aroa palette. Cool. Blue chips, good. It's the moment of truth now. That guy's in there, ready to go. I just have it paused so I could film this. Um, okay, see Fraser, this is why I need a tripod, so I can put the camera right here and not think about it anymore. But now I get to put it here and I'll be in the way. And that's okay. It's good so far. It worked great. So now that I have successfully cut the dovetail, um, I have to measure it. Now how do you measure an undercut? So what I ended up doing was I took two drill bits, two carbide drill bits, I'm using them as gauge pins, um, and I put them in the channel and then I measured the width on the outside and I do the same in cam and I tweak it until I get the right number. And then I put those settings into the tool table for the on, on the fusion side, on the computer side, and that way, all future things being made with that tool will be choice. So basically, took my two drill bits and I put one right here and I put one right there. And I take my calipers and I measure. And I'm shooting for 1.811, so it is still one thou big. Um, 
I'm not going to care for this part because I've already messed with it like four times, but the next one will be one thou smaller. Don't forget those. That means that part is done, at least the underside of it. That is it for today's video. It's making this thing, which is a dovetail fixture base. Uh, you will see over the next coming days how this shapes up and becomes an awesomer part. However, for me, this is really big. This is a big step in the right direction for this machine, for the future of this machine, and having this established and ready and working is definitely gonna help me out in the future. So that's awesome. Uh, some of which will be for knife parts, some of which will be for other stuff, but it's what this machine needs for what I need to do. So that's good. Um, that's it. I'm going home. Thanks for watching, guys. Take care. Bye. It's only 9.08 p.m. That's early for me. I gotta get back on schedule.